Welcome back. You're watching Wongozi today here on Morning Prime. Interesting editorial cartoon that we do have, of course, in the Daily Nation today. Cabinet, dismiss or dismiss. Uh, that has been the dice that has been cast, as you can see it right now. And now they are outside State House, all of them, save for the two, uh, or save for the one. That is uh, the PCS. That is Salia Mudavadi. That is the Daily Nation today. Also looking at the standard, I did it. Sawa Zaks, Sasa Anguka now, as the Gen Z will put it. And uh, Anguka now, that is a graft ink. That is also a big, big issue in this country. Stanching the flow of corruption, lancing the boil of corruption. We continue best with the conversation, looking at the headlines. All of them are carrying the same story uh, yesterday. People power in the standard today. The country has been in a turmoil for weeks after the youth rose to reject the finance bill and push for good governance. After the protest, the cabinet has been dissolved. With the president promising a broad-based and in inclusive executive and corruption purged in governments, dissolving also is a, sort of a misnomer here. They say they have been dismissed, according to, of course, our linguist, Barak Muluka. And we shall be looking at the Daily Nation as well. Why they had to fall, that is what is on the front page of the Daily Nation. I listen to you, cabinet is fired. This is what is on the front page of the Star and Good Riddance. I think uh, the people daily is really packed the punch. Eh? It's really harsh. Eh? Yeah. Good riddance. Uh, no, eh? you, they, you, have, they, are, they have no chills up here. Eh? All of them as such and say good riddance uh, because I think uh, there have been some uh, good uh, people, able, competent. Mm -hmm. Remember the last time I suggested that uh, two to three could uh, be saved and uh, not just uh, for purposes of uh, institutional memory, but uh, also because uh, there is a need for them to continue doing the good work that uh, they were doing. The majority, however, mm. I think were in space where they looked at their portfolios uh, that they occupied as uh, rewards given to them to enjoy and to feel happy. And uh, I think uh, even we in the media sometimes have uh, been uh, complicit in that kind of uh, conspiracy against the people. Because when someone is appointed, we say that uh, he or she has been uh, appointed to the lucrative position of uh, cabinet secretary of this and that. So why do we look at those positions as lucrative? Why do we describe them as lucrative? It's like they have gone there to enjoy the, the, the plum that uh, is in those uh, spaces. Uh, we are in a good place, however, where I think now we are going to reflect about these things very thoroughly. And I think that um, we are now beginning to pronounce our sovereignty as a people and our sovereignty as a nation our sovereignty and independence uh, from uh, external pressures and influences from uh, the IMF, from the World Bank, from the American uh, ambassador. I have seen that the agencies are saying that uh, the American ambassador should, should be, be shouldn't do as well. It should, should be, be recalled. Should be recalled by it's the... part of the expression and exercise of uh, our sovereignty. Mm. So the nation. If it does not uh, degenerate into a reign of terror, because you know there's the other side, uh, you know the French Revolution after uh, 1792, it unfortunately uh, sank into a reign of terror, mm. where the revolutionaries now uh, go out to visit uh, uh, terror on anybody whom they perceive to be remotely against the, the revolution. If we don't go that direction, and uh, I believe we won't, then we are now starting to assert and exercise our sovereignty, accountability, and people in government to know that they are not uh, on holiday, that uh, they are there to serve, and therefore you must think twice. Thank you. Before you accept that appointment. Right, thank you, Matt. You must think twice. No. President William Ruto has dismissed his entire cabinet in a bold decision that is unprecedented. Only 
Deputy President Rigathi Gashagwa, whose position is protected by the Constitu Constitution, and Prime Cabinet Secretary Musali Madavidi was spared in the purge. According to President Ruto, operations in government will continue uninterrupted as they will be carried out by principal secretaries. KTN's senior political affairs reporter Dan Karuki has more. Thursday last week, KTN News reported an imminent change in the cabinet by President William Ruto. The information coming at the backdrop of a cabinet meeting that had been held at State House in what is now known as the Last Supper. Several changes were announced then to cut down on government's huge budget. And Thursday, upon reflection, listening keenly to what the people of Kenya have said, and after a holistic appraisal of the performance of my cabinet and its achievements and challenges, I have today decided to dismiss with immediate effect all the cabinet secretaries and attorney general of the Republic of Kenya, of the cabinet of Kenya, except the prime cabinet secretary and cabinet secretary for secretary uh, and secretary for and cabinet secretary for foreign affairs and diaspora affairs. And of course, the office of the deputy president is not affected in any way. In his address to the nation at State House, Nairobi, President William Ruto revealed his move had been precipitated by various happenings in the country, among them the anti-government protest over the last three weeks. Recent events that necessitated the withdrawal of the finance bill, which will require a review and reorganization of our budget and fiscal management, have brought us to an inflection point. President Ruto's move coming at a time when his cabinet secretaries were making headlines all for the wrong reasons, section of Kenyans terming them incompetent. However, the president has hailed them for achievement made in the last two years. Even with the progress we have made, I am acutely aware that the people of Kenya have very high expectations of me. And they believe that this administration can undertake the most extensive transformation in our nation's history. I will immediately engage in extensive consultations across different sectors and political formations and other Kenyans. But where did the rain start beating Ruto's cabinet? Political pundits say arrogance, corruption, display of flamboyance and opulence, failure by the CSS to communicate government programs to the people, gave a leeway for misinformation and propaganda, prompting Gen Z's to protest calling for good governance. KTN News has learned that last week in the cabinet, the head of state vented and told the CSS that he was to blame for the mess in the country, as he had put his trust and hope for the wrong people who in turn contributed to the aggression by the Kenyans. President Ruto's decision to dissolve his entire cabinet is interpreted as a strategy that will redeem his dwindling popularity. With the latest development, focus will now be shifting to the new names that are going to be making it to the new cabinet once President William Ruto kicks off the process to reconstitute the cabinet. Daniel Karioki, KTN News, State House, Nairobi. And once again, the Gen Z has scored a big following President Ruto's decision to send home all cabinet secretaries. This is just the latest gain after the series or a series of other concessions made by the ruling Kenya Kwanzaa government. And as re our reporter Vera Mora now reports, President's, all the President Ruto's decision over the last few weeks have been influenced by the Gen Z's. They say once bitten, twice shy. After Generation Z occupied Parliament on 25th of June 2024, President William Ruto drafted the controversial Finance Bill 2024. Listening keenly to the people of Kenya, 
who have said loudly that they want nothing to do with this finance bill 2024. I concede and therefore I will not sign the 2024 finance bill and it shall subsequently be withdrawn. On this day, Generation Z bagged a big win for the very first time, but this did not stop them. They continued to organize protests all over the country, a clear indication that the goal shifted from rejecting the finance bill to other issues in Ruto's government. <laughs> Through the social media platforms, the Gen Zs have always aired their demands. Four weeks later, this generation managed to influence major changes in government, including Occupy Parliament, rejecting the Finance Bill 2024, scrapping off of CAS positions, reducing numbers of advisors, reconstruction of IEBC that the President assented on the day that the Gen Z planned to occupy IEBC. Perhaps the biggest issue they scored high was the push for cabinet dissolution, which was realized on Thursday. On social media, more hashtags are coming up to address the unmet demands, including the restoration of Linda Mama program, restoration of school feeding program, scrapping off of shift program, detailed audit of the national debt, which President Ruto has already gazetted, but is currently being challenged in court. Others include employment of intern doctors and the employment of JSS teachers, which the president has already assured will be done despite challenges. So I want to tell all our JSS teachers, despite the challenges we have in the finance bill, we are going to make sure that we confirm all teachers under JSS before the end of this year so that they can teach knowing that as we agreed, they will serve under permanent and pensionable terms. The president's decision has left many in shock. But the question is, what is this tribeless, leaderless, and faceless generation planning as the hashtag shifts to Ruto must go? Vera, Mora, Kitty News, Nairobi. And we continue with the conversation here, of course, looking at what is the way forward. Now that uh, we have concessions from the government, the cabinet has been dismissed, uh, save for one. Uh, also, we have uh, the formation of a task force to just look also on uh, the public debt issue in the country as well. The, we can see they're gagging for more. The same, we're coming to the counties, of course, as well. They need transparency from the governors uh, going by what we saw in Bomet yesterday. Uh, I think... Honorable Kiro, I was on your side as well before I had some issues with your mic, but uh, yes. I hope you've not lost your track of thought. Well, I've not lost, yes. but I hope also the mic is It's okay. good, it's good, it's good. Yeah, let's Wonderful. continue. So I was just giving the background to our thinking and the mentality of Kenyans. That it's only 2013, 2018 that we had some semblance of opposition, but subsequent to that, of course, we had the handshake. I'm saying this because the position that has now been taken by Generation Z arises out of the fact that the opposition has not been able to play its role very well. The opposition has gone to bed with government almost immediately after every other election or every election. And this creates a vacuum in terms of leadership and the required checks and balances between those in power and those in the opposition. Now, as to whether all these can be attributed to the inadequacy of the cabinet to perform, I beg to differ in the sense that I know most of these cabinet ministers and uh, I know most of them are qualified, are people that I can term to be beyond reproach in as many areas as possible. Perhaps those who are displaying some laggies were excited out of the fact that they won an election that was bitterly fought. Now, my, my request is that uh, the president should do serious soul searching before he gets a team of Kenyans to work with him for the next three years. In that team of Kenyans, he must look beyond the political formations that he referred to. He must look for also for people 
who he knows, once they come in, they'll be able to engage him as a friend, as a partner in nation building, but not as a boss. Because that is where I feel the main source of trouble in the Ruta administration has arisen. Apart from celebration of the winning in 2022, they went ahead to display that there is a difference between those who have been elected and those who have lost elections. Remember, there are many members of parliament who got in with about 20,000 votes or less, and the other people also who fought for other positions, and perhaps they got to have 100,000 votes. So winning and losing is this space that we need to respect, that losing an election is still a very honorable exercise, depending on how you take it. Uh, losing an election, uh, winning an election is also something that you need to take with a bit of humility. Now, the second issue that I feel the president should look as he reflects is to allow institutions to operate. Fifteen cases were brought down immediately to cover. These cases were actually the And some of the people who were affected by those cases were taken again to positions where they had some cases including some chairmen of institutions which they had an active case in court of law. That creates some institutional morass which should not be allowed. The second issue is also killing of political parties. Today, when we won, ele when he won elections in 2022, he had seven members less than ours, those in Asimio. But he has increasingly moved and almost decimated us as a meal of its membership. And I hope the GNCs will be respected that we do not have a GNU, Government of National Unity. You should just get Kenyans who can do that job. And I'm not suggesting that I'm one of them. But there are many Kenyans around the, 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 the board who can work with him for the next three years. But having a government that will be a semblance of him coming together with ODM, that will spell a lot of doom to the political arrangement that we have today. I suggest the president should look for individuals who fit the bill, mm -hmm. but not necessarily from these polit political formations. There right. are many Kenyans who may be willing to work with him, mm -hmm. and there are also many Kenyans who are shy to want to work with him. Right. Yeah. yeah you're saying that, uh, and you're not one of them, we're sort of uh, playing a reverse psychology. Yeah? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, no, I'm just saying, uh, yeah. my, my Tang family, Chick, you, yeah, uh, not one of them, but of course now you, you'll be, you'll, your head will pop up as one of them as well. Mm, I think, uh, Dibal, to be very honest, if, if he called me tomorrow that I, he wants me to work with him, I will say no. I feel the space I'm occupying in the opposition today is as important as any other position in government. Mm. So for me, I'm very clear from the beginning of time, I will not take any position, because I'm saying this, Dibal, because since yesterday, there are many Kenyans who are sending me SMS that should you get an appointment, accept it for our sake. For their sake, I just want to advise them, I will not take any position. If the president calls me, I will respectfully see him, but I will tell him I'm not taking any position. I've been a minister before, and there's nothing exciting about being a minister unless you are given the space to work. And some of those ministers who have gone home, unfortunately, I'm sure many of them would have wanted to work, but they were not given that space. I feel they are qualified and they are okay. also ethical, right. but they were not given the space. All right, let, let's interrogate now the issue of uh, the president being on the sharpest edge of uh, horns of a dilemma here, because you can hear him saying also uh, the political formations could be a consideration. And we've seen the Gen Zs are saying, oh, oh, we do not even want any regurgitations of those old faces again on our screens. We don't want to see them again. We, we just need a fresh new slate of, you know, energetic people who will come with fresh ideas at the end of the day. What does it really portend? Uh, even for the institutional memory, if you have a fresh breed of cabinets, uh, secretaries who are coming, uh, they have never had maybe experientially, save maybe for the technical part of it that we have in the government that will be running and advising them. Do you think uh, that will be the wisest of, sh of things to do or to act? Uh, <clears throat> I've got a number of things to say. I think the very first one is that um, 
what uh, we've gone through in the last week mm. has brought alive the uh, concept of public participation. Mm -hmm. Really, our constitution is very, very big in pub public participation. Article 1, sovereignty, 10, 35, 118, where all laws, 119, 201, 221, 223, and 251, where um, public officers, I mean, the public can actually participate in ensuring that public officers who are not uh, productive are, um, are dismissed. But from what we know is that public participation has not been effective. Mm. It has been um, uh, yes in laws and in the constitution, but um, people always uh, got their way. But this particular time with, um, with, with the Gen Zs, um, uh, what the Gen Zs did um, actually has brought up a reflection that the people actually need to be heard. And even uh, the ministers who who uh, who, um, who were fired, um, uh, you can hear the ones and the public has been quite vocal on whom they thought was active and effective, and whom they did not think was active, um, uh, active, and uh, uh, and effective. So I think the voice of the people will bring to bear in terms of. Uh, delivery mm -hmm. in public service. The second thing is uh, I do not think that um, uh, uh, that uh, the ministers living live with uh, institutional memory. Actually, civil service, that's why it's called civil service, mm -hmm. uh, is a whole system yes, yes. Uh, that uh, is continuous. And its memory is there. And its memory, memory is, is there. there. It continues uh, from one uh, regime to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, for the government to work, uh, you, the incoming regime should never interfere with the core mm -hmm. of uh, that uh, public service. But as Honorable Kiro has said, is that they need, need to be given the opportunity and, uh, and, time, and, uh, and time to work. Our political system, um, uh, and I'll go back to what Honorable Kiro was saying, is that how many of our politicians are really called? Because uh, politics is a calling. You want to, you are act, or you are driven, or you are motivated by the value and difference you want to make uh, in people's life. And I must say that our president, uh, to a large extent, has shown that vigor and valor of adding value and making a difference um, to, to, to the lives of uh, the people of Kenya. But a lot of the people who go into politics or even get appointed in public, uh, um, public institutions go there for their own being to um, line their pockets and to add value and make a difference to, their, to themselves without considering how many people are dying of malaria, how many uh, children are not going to school, teachers are not being paid, we are not, uh, um, we, we are not. So I believe, I would want to think that um, you know, the new people that the president is going to appoint are people not only uh, who are competent, but people who have, um, are value driven people who are mission uh, driven uh, mission driven and uh, uh, I know that there is pressure you're talking of 20 um, we have 42 communities 50 million it's still possible to find competent people who are meritocracy who are who are meritocracy but also achieve uh, that aspect of um, uh, that aspect of equity where people feel that they've been, because I mean, people are, want to relate to government when they can see faces that they know, faces that they trust, but also faces uh, that um, need and can deliver. Uh, last but not least, um, the, um, the president talked about um, about consultation. I, I, I didn't hear him say about talking. I didn't hear him talk about national unity or going to form a government of national unity. But he said that, I mean, he wants to form a broad-based government. And broad-based government does not necessarily mean that it's a government of national unity. We know that this happened um, 
uh, when we had a problem in uh, 2008, I mean, what we had was more or less a government of national unity, which, no, which is not quite unique. We know in 1994 when Mandela came out of, um, out of prison and uh, he was elected as president, to a large extent he formed a government of national unity for, because he needed everybody to feel in, in, included. Obviously others are forced by, 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 by constitutional like um, what, uh, by the constitution like what has just happened in South Africa. But I believe that uh, the president, uh, in his wisdom, and I believe that the last four weeks have been the loneliest part mm. of his life because he didn't know who to trust because the, most of the people around him mm. are there for themselves. Are, yeah, are there for themselves. So he didn't know who would give him um, uh, honest uh, opinion, uh, honest feedback, without those people thinking about themselves first. Mm -hmm. yeah. But before we have the speech of the president, I think every word really matters because it's bound to be deciphered differently by the different constituents of the, po of the population. So if the choice of words when you talk about broad-based, because everyone is wondering what is this broad-based? The devil is in the details. Uh, people come up with the government of national unity. The optics that we saw also uh, on the floor there, just on the, on the stairs of the Kenyatta International Convention Center, tells all that there is a dialogue. And we've seen how uh, we had so much vitriol coming from the Gen Z regarding dialogue and conversations of dialogue. We don't need them anymore. So maybe they're trying to connect, you know, <coughs> a thread here and there on the words that have been said. And you now, when you're writing your speech, and I know you, you're the strategic yes. communication advisor, you think of every... <laughs> Every Iota, every item, yes, every every, every T that will cause every comma. It is it is coming from the presidency. Words have impact and import at the end of the day. So you just don't pick any word ad hocery and you know place it there because people are going to de to decipher it differently. And we've talked about communications. And one of the things that uh, has failed this particular regime has been the aspect of communication. And even the president has alluded to the fact that. Uh, his communication team has yes. has not been up to scratch at the end of the day. Barack. You know, especially an address of uh, such monumental significance, uh, diction, felicity of diction, mm -hmm. the choice of word, every word, every lexical item in that address, every comma, every full stop, <coughs> every full colon, every semicolon, every hyphen, every hyphen, they matter. And um, when we say a broad best government, the president has obviously looked at the constitution and his advisors, I don't know who they would be in this case, since uh, former Attorney General Muturi said he was not being consulted. But uh, Article 3, Two says that any attempt to establish a government otherwise mm -hmm. than in compliance with this constitution is unlawful. And having possibly reflected about that, the council that uh, has um, uh, uh, informed that thought with uh, the president, they possibly opted for the euphemism of broad best rather than government of national unity. And therefore, taking that uh, broad brush approach, mm. you can go out and uh, walk the nation through a dialogue, and that dialogue would uh, endorse that thought about a broad-based government, and therefore you are able to bring on board um, persons who represent uh, different fraternities, and those fraternities may include the political opposition, so that uh, we shouldn't be surprised to see a cabinet uh, secretary being appointed, uh, for example, from uh, ODM, or from uh, Azimio itself uh, a lot more broadly. And I also think that by the time these gentlemen were materializing on the steps of uh, KRCC, to make that uh, maiden balloon floating proclamation, they had already discussed and processed where they wanted to go. 
but uh, they were obviously conscious of uh, public sensitivity and the possibility of a backlash. So you come and you start testing the waters. Then you can uh, walk the nation through six days of uh, dialogue and arrive at the self-same conclusion of uh, what you had processed uh, elsewhere. And so a uh, government of national unity in any other guise under any other label is the same thing. If we are going to see uh, people, especially from um, uh, ODM, from Azimio, coming into this uh, formation, then that is where we are. But they can always uh, uh, defend themselves and say that um, it's a broad-based government. It's not a government of national unity. Mm -hmm. But the difference is the same. The difference is the same. So uh, your assessment is even the objects that we saw on the Kenyatta International Center, that was bound to come. It was in the pipeline. It is, it is only that uh, now the circumstances, maybe they were a bit diffi difficult, but the NADCO report, uh, because these talks have been there before, that they could be the coming together of uh, a government of national Dubai unity. Yes. Has been ongoing. It has been ongoing. I don't have the facts, but I think I'm now adult enough to know that to this dots, conversation yes. has been ongoing for a while. The fundamental reason why President Ruto did not do on the 26th of uh, June 2024 what he did yesterday was because the conversation was still in progress. And I think as I sit here that it has already been agreed you will have six We'll have seven, I'll have this. It has even been agreed that uh, at the talks we will have so many delegates, you will have so many delegates, the Gen Z will have so many delegates, and the rest of the Republic will have so many delegates to legitimize the whole thing. And the way forward is certainly very clear in the minds of the most uh, critical interlocutors mm -hmm. in this process. Mm -hmm. All right, let's hear from uh, Professor uh, Kindiki. Uh, for that particular matter, uh, I just wanted to ask the question uh, regarding also the, the optics that we had, that AUC quest by Ray Loading as for the chairmanship and him coming back to the political, you know, or the local politics at the end of the day. Uh, people saying, you know, I think he ruled uh, he rules that particular day that he was advised to come and appear because that also sort of has obliterated him mm. politically. Mm. That that should not have happened. And him circling back and saying, oh, I've listened now to the Gen Z and uh, I will not even talk anything about dialogue. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dubal. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's very difficult and uh, very challenging to differentiate terminologies which are used by, <clears throat> by people studying or linguistics and law and other things. Uh, I'm saying that because that, uh, you find that uh, politicians sometimes make statements from the political point of view, but one statement from a politician may be interpreted differently by a lawyer somebody is doing languages because they, they, they look at the commas, full stops, hyphens and all those uh, requirements in uh, studies uh, linguistics or languages. So now um, for the, 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 the honorable uh, Raira Odinga to, 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 to accept to be nominated as um, AU uh, position is, is, is not something that is uh, abnormal because that is, is, is also a democratic <coughs> right. And the fact that he's an opposition leader does not mean that he cannot hold in office. And if he's agreed in some circles or political circles that should go for it, then so be it. But those can be interpreted wrongly. And I think, um, uh, again, politics. It's not something that is static. What was yesterday may change tomorrow because of this, the circumstances that are there. 
The politics of 1960s, 70s are different from 80s, 90s. That's why you find even the Gen Zs are coming in. This is a new wave, uh, which was not there maybe some years back. So um, what I think is that let the opposition, those who are in the opposition, do their work, and those who are also in the government, because there is government, the Kenya Kwanzaa government, also do their work. So they should, there should not be a blame that it is um, this group that has been derailed me, because people have independent way of looking at things. And, 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 I, and, I, and I think the challenge we have is not that, but whatever may come now to the formation of government, whatever government that is going to be formed, whether they call it broad-based or whatever, it's government that will bring people together. Because why are people giving different views? And some of them are so drastic that they are impending development. The financial bill was not approved. And why? Because people did not accept it. Majority of people. And you look at the statistics, people are saying, no, we don't want. And the president has said, that's fine. That's the process now of trying to involve people and to, uh, you know, people to feel accommodated in the process. Because one person cannot lead the whole country. Not one, but because we are all there. So, and, but I think the challenges we are facing as Kenyans it's not here, neither there, but it's about chapter 6 of the Constitution. And that's where the whole problem comes. If you read chapter 6 of the Constitution of Kenya, it will carry other chapters. Because if there is um, integrity in leadership, uh, I don't see these things being questioned. The problem is our leaders. Maybe some of them don't read that chapter. And you come there and then you, you don't know that uh, there is a difference because uh, of this political statement that you're making during the campaigns. I know you are given a position of leadership and you are the, 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 the leader of both the government and the opposition. So if you continue playing the politics of the opposition in that position of leadership, then of course it's going to jeopardize your, your effectiveness. And uh, some of our colleagues here have already stated that uh, some of this, all this uh, cabinet, it's not that they are not qualified. Most of them are very qualified people because they went through the vetting process. And the Kenya are so, and they could see what was happening and even the way they were responding. But when you give them work because of other issues of not differentiating the politics and also now working now as um, a state officer, then that now has brought some of these challenges. But I do believe um, there is light at the end of the tunnel, or it's not lost. Uh, as a country, we have learned a lot. And as we move forward in uh, the days to come, there will be changes differently. Mm -hmm. But the chapter six of the Constitution, my plea is to all leaders, if we are here to hit, it will answer some of these problems like about corruption. It's something obvious. It's well stated what a state officer should do about corruption. He should not engage in corruption. And when Gen Z say, where is our money? If you promise this much, has it done that? And it's, it's an obvious question to the leaders because they should have been accountable. Thank you. And it's in leadership. Thank you. You know, in that chapter, if, if they read it elaborately, it will cover other chapters. Thank you. And they will not violate any of the, of the, right, you know, you. the articles of the Constitution. Okay. Let, me, let me come to you, Kipruto Rabkirwa, and ask mm -hmm. the question. Uh, I'm inclined to wonder, why, why do you think the president left uh, the, the, the Prime Cabinet Secretary? Why was, well, was he left? Is it for any political experience, looking from the political angle? I'm imagining it's for a balancing act. You know, at times when we are in the studio, we don't say some things. But uh, let us accept that today... You don't say some things, why are you being editorial with some things? Uh, I, th I think you come out here to bear, to bear it all out. We, let all no, we don't say some out. things because uh, <laughs> it should not be good manners. But uh, what we know today is that there are altercations between the president and his deputy. And perhaps Msalia appears to be the stabilizing force. 
and uh, doing away with him, he would be left with somebody who doesn't talk to him. Because the president will definitely need some people to assist him form the next cabinet and uh, by extension the next, uh, uh, the, the, the next uh, government to operate for the intervening period. So let me leave it there. Uh, so, and uh, of course, Msali has a lot of experience when it comes to running government. Not that he learned in school, but he has learned on the job. And he's a man you can trust. I'm not really trying to play second fiddle to him, but it's good to say the way it is. And that's why when people almost rubbish the entire cabinet, I think it's not true. There are good people like Msalia. There are good people also that I don't want to, want to name. But I've listened to them, I've known their CVs, and we've interacted in the past, and we still interact, and I find they are good people. And that's why we seem to be running away from this reality that President William Ruto has been a micromanager. That is where the problem is. Even if you are to put a cabinet of angels and President Ruto does not behave in a way that he allows ministers to operate, that is what you call micromanagement and is not likely to produce But results. why would you micromanage? Yeah, uh, first of all, you have to uh, understand maybe the frustration that is coming from for him to micromanage. He has been, of course, in the public gallery decrying the fact that he knows so much than some of his cabinet secretaries that uh, he had appointed. Well, l l l so l if they were <laughs> underperforming, why would he not really micromanage? Because he felt uh, you uh, delegated and you're not really performing. And the performance the is a product of somebody breathing on your neck. I, 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 I would breathe on your neck, first of all, yeah. because I feel sometimes you're not really delivering. That's how I'll be, hey, why is it this comma is not here? But uh, Why is the full stop <laughs> not there? Let's not, let's not argue a lot. Because it's not really argue. We're I'm, just trying to I'm, interrogate I'm talking why. from some little experience and my training as somebody in governance and leadership. And what I know, and I know those who have been at the level, like Dr. Kidero, will know that make sure that you are clear and you allow your vision to be collective vision of the organization and you must imbue that vision to the rest of critical staff members. Once you've done that, keep people the roadmap and they will be able to do it and you give them space to give you back results. Otherwise, if you say everybody is not performing, either you never appointed the right team or you have not allowed the team to produce some synergy. Because the way people work is that you must allow them to feel they are being involved. And those who are not getting involved, you nudge them on for them to get involved in the business of the day. And that is what I've seen. The president has had a problem. Miscommunication internally and interfacing with the public. Some of the challenges that the current president has is selling of jobs and tenders. And that makes people very unhappy. What do you mean selling of jobs and tenders? Tenders for your child to join the military, 400,000, 600,000. You go to Ziwa, where, which is his former constituency, you will find parents come with money. So that by the time they say so-and-so has qualified after running and going through basic medical deaths, they, they have to produce some money. Parents know, if I was lying, I would not have the courage to say it on TV. Selling of tenders. You saw even uh, the other day, senators, they want to get involved in tendering process or getting involved in tenders. These are some of the problems affecting our society. And if they give ODM, for example, positions, they are solving a short-term problem. But the main issue is that the president must uh, pull back, allow his minister to work, and direct them from a distance. I got three phone calls from Kibaki for the five years I was his minister. Otherwise, we used to seek appointment to go and brief him. I got only three phone calls in the entire five years as his minister of work to catch him. The president almost calls, goes even beyond the minister, calls the peers, calls the director. So these are some of the things that uh, cannot, in, in the architecture of the current constitution, it is very complicated. The second issue, the ball, because we want to resolve these issues. We don't want President Ruta to be sent home. Now, if after, after 2027 he doesn't win, that's okay. But for now, we want peace. 
Now, the architecture between the advisors and the ministers is something that must also be interrogated so that it does not have a cabinet of advisors almost at the exclusion of the ministers. Then the ministers come in as if they are going to be told this is what to do. Exactly. The, this is, is the way I'm looking at it. Right. I wanted just to interrogate that particular aspect of, uh, yes, you, you've just oriented that, that particular thoughts, that we have a parallel kitchen cabinet that the president thinks these are the competent people that he can actually run to for, uh, for advisory uh, and for, for counsel at the end of the day. And you have the cabinet that uh, was put together because of political balancing and expediency and posturing at the end of the day, but you don't fully trust that you will deliver, but I've paid back, you know, what you actually, what was your input on the campaign at the end of the day. But these are the people I want to work with. This parallelism that we've had maybe has brought this antagonism that we've, we've seen and the implosion within uh, his government at the end of the day. And even Speaking maybe from your experience, experientially as a CEO as well, why would you want to be a micromanager if you feel like uh, maybe the people you've appointed are not really delivering? So you'll be on their neck. You'll turn out to be a foot on the neck manager that uh, they feel like you're being uh, sort of very, yeah, uh, <laughs> not really, I, I don't know the, the right choice of what to put there, but uh, you understand my, my yeah. train of thought. Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, uh, the, 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 the management of private companies and uh, public management probably are a little bit uh, different. My only experience is when I was the uh, governor of Nairobi. I tried to employ my skills and experience that I gained uh, uh, in, um, in the private sector, but probably they were a little bit too fast. Mm. I mean, um, uh, because uh, the reason why um, public service is called a bureaucracy is because uh, uh, the wheels turn very on very, 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 very slowly. slowly. But, but also, given the level of the kind of assets that the public have, they are huge, huge has assets. Mm. You, they, they, they have to be considered. They, mm. have, they need to be managed in a certain manner. But allow me to just to go back to, to uh, Musalia's uh, mm. attention. Yes. I think it's absolutely right, right that Musalia probably in the <coughs> current uh, system has got, uh, has no much in terms of experience. You remember he joined um, the cabinet right uh, from the university in his 20s, and he's played a major role in public service through and through. He's been a minister of finance, and he's been a minister for local government. He's been a deputy uh, president. Yes. And I would say that he knows uh, the workings of the government, more or less, inside out. So he's a, a very, very big asset to uh, President Ruto. Of course, the second thing is the one responsible for um, foreign affairs and uh, foreign, re foreign relations and uh, foreign uh, discussions. Um, whether there's cabinet or no cabinet must continue going on. And given that portfolio, there was no way that that was going to be left uh, um, uh, to, uh, to be open. But I believe to a large extent, He's um, uh, a good tool to the president in the current um, in the in, in, um, in the current dynamics, and even um, and even um, uh, going uh, forward. Uh, the president is a young man, very energetic and very very intelligent. Uh, he thinks fast, and of course he employs what you call umbwa. Management by wandering uh, around, around uh, by, by walking around or by wandering around. And in history, all effective managers, including CEOs, practice, practice umbwa. <coughs> and maybe because of that, he tends to know more. Uh, at times, even, uh, even better than uh, the ministers. But once you've known the kind of boss you, you... Because at the end of the day, the president is the one whom we elected as candidates. He's the one whom we are, whom we are, uh, we must put to task. The Kenyans must put him to task. And uh, his ministers and PSs have got delegated authority from him, but the person whom Kenyans turn to, it is him. So he's right to demand um, the very, very uh, best of the energies and the very, very best of speeds very, very best of knowledge 
from his ministers. And again, I must think it was very, very frustrating for him if he gets to know or he knows because he reads a lot, he consults a lot, and having been, uh, he's been in um, the system for well over 40 years. So over that time, uh, he has a very uh, rich um, wealth in terms of people whom he know, people whom he's worked with, uh, and um, uh, information flow from uh, various, uh, um, various, uh, various sources. Uh, on the issue of um, advisors, uh, I think advi you have advisors, yes, but uh, you're the one who's responsible for the decisions. And my own opinion is um, why advisors should always stay in the background. I mean, I know that um, Barack Mbuka has been an advisor, apart from being a communication expert. But I don't think he's been on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe Barack already is still lives much earlier. <laughs> Barack already still lives much earlier. Oh, he, he bolted away. Oh, oh. <laughs> Like, uh, so disengaged <laughs> <laughs> on our face. And, he, he, had, he had been disengaged himself. And, uh, <laughs> advisors, when things work, the when things work <laughs> they take credit. Mm -hmm. When they don't work, uh, they leave uh, the ball with the person whom they were advising. Mm -hmm. So advisors yeah. must always stay in the ground. Actually, the principal advisor to the president should be the cabinet secretary. Yes. Uh, the, cabi yeah. the cabinet secretary. So, uh, and I don't think that it was any different in uh, this particular time. All right. Uh, in this particular time. All right. So, Barack, this call for the advisors that we will cut them by 50%, uh, <laughs> with this dismissal, if you came with your own advisors, you came with your own team as well, you as a cabinet secretary, also now you are shown the door. That, that's how it works. Yes, absolutely. Advisors uh, serve uh, during the, the, the tenure, the tenure of, yes. of uh, the cabinet secretary, and it is very clear that uh, away from uh, their own request to disengage earlier, like some of us uh, did, uh, they you are leave. disengaged, then you disengage the, the, yourself as well. Yes, mm -hmm. you can also disengage uh, yourself. <laughs> Yeah. So you had a conscience that uh, you don't want to take a salary that you're not really <laughs> working for. You know the ball when you are. Uh, this is what you're alluding for. An, an intelligent to the person, mm -hmm. you can see where this thing is going. And when you give advice and it's not listened to, it is spanned and it's like uh, you are doing nothing there. You can see very clearly that we are hurtling down a cliff. Mm. If you are an intelligent person you request for the opportunity to be disengaged. Mm. And uh, they will only be too willing to allow you to do that because there are many people waiting in the wings mm. to occupy uh, that space. People are going to be a lot more compliant to that kind of uh, environment. Okay? That is where um, that, 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 that uh, kind of uh, separation comes in. Mm. But otherwise you serve during the tenure of the CS. But uh, when you are a, an advisor to a cabinet uh, secretary, for example, you must recognize and respect the fact that uh, there is the established public service, that there are senior public officers who are there, who understand the policies, who understand the standard operating procedures uh, better than yourself, you come in bringing some technical expertise uh, of a professional nature in a, a given environment, and therefore you are adding value to what all these people are doing. Your role is to help the minister to process the thinking and to consult further and bridge but if you constitute yourselves into some kitchen cabinet that then uh, alienates the public service, that is the first point where things start falling between the, through the, the cracks. And it gets worse in State House, where you may find that uh, the advisors go on to constitute informal government within the government and it is what they are doing that is running the government 
but it doesn't just run the government, it ruins the government. And the head of state will find himself in a very difficult uh, place, such as um, our president finds himself today. Mm -hmm. It is possible that he has had an inefficient cabinet, mm -hmm. uh, possibly because of some inbuilt inefficiency in terms of uh, who was appointed, in terms of their inability to understand, to work and to deliver. But it's also possible that His Excellency the President mm -hmm. has been working with a different cabinet that is not the cabinet that he has dismissed. Mm. And therefore, His Excellency the President needs to look at the entirety of the notion and concept of, con of, of cabinet in his government. And he may find that the cabinet that he really needs to dismiss mm. is the informal cabinet. The metaphysical. The <laughs> informal cabinet around him <laughs> that thinks that it is the presidency. Mm -hmm. If he leaves that informal cabinet intact, mm. it doesn't matter even if he brings back another cabinet of angels and saints. That informal cabinet is going to derail it and he will find himself in this place again. Fantastic. All right, we shall interrogate that uh, a little bit. We just want to take a short break. I can see it's uh, just a few minutes past eight. And when we circle back, of course, with the tail end of the program, we try and analyze as well uh, some of uh, the litigations that we have, especially with the public debt and uh, the task force thereof. Uh, some suggest that the uh, Law Society of Kenya should be in that particular uh, task force at the end of the day. But questions about duplications, this is the present what I said yesterday, is arising because uh, we have a consummate auditor general, she's been doing a stunning job. Uh, all this that uh, is a job description of the task force as well is what is enshrined in the constitution of what an auditor general should do. And the people are saying, why should we be having all these task forces at the end of the day if we're trying to have austerity measures? And, uh, should we go full steam ahead and uh, install it? So we want to interrogate that as well. We take a short break, you're watching Mongoz here on Morning Prime.